When was the last time that you bought something that you needed to connect to the internet to use? Maybe it was an Alexa, maybe a smart plug, or even just a printer. Maybe you've got a pet cam to watch the little ones while you take a weekend away? What if I told you that each thing you connect to the internet presents a lock? A lock that can be picked. And once it opens up, there's a whole new world for hackers to look at. A very personal peek into your private life. My name is John Cordes, and this week, we're going to switch it up a little bit. Instead of telling you just one story, I'm going to tell you the story of many things. More specifically, an internet of things. So come with me while I tell you a couple of smaller stories about some of the weirdest and wildest hacks in this internet of things, and explain to you what the shell happened to make them such a problem. I want to start the top of the episode here with a bit of a dive into what I say when I mean an Internet of Things. Broadly speaking, the Internet of Things is kind of any piece of technology that has to communicate across the Internet in order to function. Your first thought here might be something like your computer or your phone, and you wouldn't be incorrect there. But that's just a narrow bit of the full scope. Think about the concept of a smart home, for example. Everything that you're thinking about there is a part of the Internet of Things. From a smart light bulb to your Alexa, sometimes even a fridge or an oven can be a part of it. They all operate on some level, either tangential to or across the Internet, for their functionality to work. It's why you can turn your living room light on or off from your phone even when you're on vacation. And that's just a stereotypical look at what constitutes a thing on the Internet. So let's zoom the scope out a little bit further and examine it again. Do you or someone you know have a new car? It's possible that the firmware updates for that car comes from the server from the company across the internet. Or maybe you've got an app on your phone to control the little things for it, like the remote start. There's another small example of it. Maybe you've got a ring doorbell for security. That's something that, again, needs the internet connection to alert you every time there's motion at your door. We're gonna zoom out again. Maybe you've got a baby monitor, so you can check in on your newborn while you're at work or while the nanny's over and you're out. Maybe you're a bit on the older side and using a pacemaker with connectivity to your mobile device to give you and your doctor medical information about your heart and send that to the hospital so that they can recommend any changes to your medication that might be needed. It never really stops. Like I said at the top of a show, If you've had to configure it to connect to the internet or your Wi-Fi, it's a part of that internet of things. And when you start looking at each and every item that can be classified there, and start to think about the worst ways those might be able to be exploited, it kind of gets a little bit scary. It's not always scary. Sometimes it's interesting. So let's start there, in a bit of an interesting case, and see how a casino gambled on their own security through something unlikely on the Internet of Things. We're going to go back to 2017 here. And for this scenario, I'm going to put you in the role of a security analyst for the unnamed casino. Your job? Well, you respond to alerts for things that might be abnormal on the network, or that might look like it's a sign that you've been compromised. Recently, you and your team decided to pilot a cool new tool called Darktrace. And that tool aims to help you identify those weak points or abnormalities. And almost as soon as it's looking at one device in particular, it's noticing some pretty weird behavior. Specifically that that device had exfiltrated around 10 gigs of data to an IP address in Finland. Darktrace would look at everything it's got its hands in and then at this device and say that this was a bit of an abnormality because no other device was connecting to that location. This was the only one. And that device really wasn't communicating to much else any differently than some of the other IoT devices on the network. I'm going to stop there because I'm realizing that might be the first time I'm using the phrase IoT, which is just my shortening of Internet of Things. It's a pretty common term in the industry. So what was the evil plant here? The device that was causing all of these problems for the casino? Well, it was a fish tank. More specifically, it was a sensor in the fish tank. You see, recently... The unnamed casino had decided that in order to impress its patrons, they were going to up their game in terms of their display. 
They wanted to get some great new fish and make sure that they were properly cared for. And there's no crime in that. That's probably what these kinds of things are for. But a part of that effort meant that they wanted to get a sensor from a fish tank to monitor the temperature and purity levels of the water. Naturally, that sensor would be reporting to various tools and devices across the network to make sure things were adjusted as needed and alert anyone whenever there was a problem. But that meant it had to be hooked up to a network connection. On the back end of the sensor, it probably ran on some low-level Linux distribution that the attacker had used an exploited mechanic against. Or perhaps the attacker had just gone one level up and out of a casino and compromised the company that owned the sensor itself and gotten in that way. The report from Darktrace didn't give all the details, so it's a little bit up to speculation. The thing that matters is that the attacker was already in. The attacker was here, but because they were smart, they were able to make out with that 10 gigs of company data, some of which would have been highly coveted and sought after from its competitors. And what happened after they got in and started going for that data? Well, we've talked about it in the past, but sometimes the best thing you can do when you're in is just to be patient. The attacker masked their traffic in sporadic bits of communication across the network, trying not to do too much out of fear that they might be recognized as something a bit more malicious than what they wanted to present as. Unfortunately for them, the exfiltration meant that they'd end up burned because it was just too big of a move to do all at once, and that was sure to alert someone that something was up. Maybe that's what they were thinking too. It could very well have been that the attacker knew once they took this data they'd be out and done. Because not many details here were released, it's a little bit hard to know exactly what kind of information was stolen, but I think we can take a guess. Think about a casino and the kinds of information they might have had at their disposal. You'd have access to potential account information, network diagrams, high roller data, hotel info, maybe even security documents that might lead to a better way to maintain persistence later on. A way back in, if you will. Whatever it was, only the casino, Dark Trace, and the hacker really know about it right now. But I do sometimes wonder if it was worth it. Was the water just clear enough to justify this? I mean, at least the fish were unharmed, but still. It was potentially a pretty high price to pay for a low level of convenience that could have just been done with some manual tools or something from a pool store. If that seems a bit out of reach for you, the listener, let's take it a bit more close to home. This time, I'm going to put you in the role of a concerned parent. In order to keep a close eye on the baby, you've gotten a nest camera for your baby's room. That way, if you're out or in another room, you'll have visibility and awareness into what's going on in the nursery. It's not uncommon. Baby monitors aren't anything new and they've been around for quite a while. Albeit maybe they haven't been around in the form of video as much until the last few years. At least in the past, they'd have been relatively secluded to radio frequencies. That meant that at a minimum, you'd at least need to be in the immediate area if someone was going to attempt to snoop on you. Since those smaller radios in baby monitors were fairly limited in terms of their own range. So here's the scenario. You've put little Shelby down to bed and decide to get ready for bed yourself. And you're finally on your way to your first good night's sleep in a long time. Midway through the night, you hear some beeps and you think it's odd, but you don't pay too much mind to it. Then something a bit more intense happens. The baby monitor that you linked the Nest camera to, well, Suddenly, there's a man's voice coming out of it, and he's saying some pretty explicit things. You dart awake, you turn on the lights, and then the camera in your room activates. The one that you have for your own security turns on, and that voice that you just heard coming out of a baby monitor, it's back. And this time it addresses you, directly. And it says, I'm going to kidnap your baby. I'm in your baby's room. This was the case with Ellen and Nathan Rigney. The Rignies bolted upstairs into their baby's room, and no one was there. Things were just as they should have been, and her child was passed out. A nice good night's sleep. So what happened here? A hacker had made their way into the account that controlled their home security network, which included the ability to broadcast out audio messages across the tools. And that let the hacker have their way with these cameras, baby monitors, and honestly, probably a couple other things that weren't disclosed. I would assume that because it was a Nest environment, they probably had a thermostat under their belt. Maybe a couple light switches, things like that. 
and this hacker just decided to scare the living daylight out of a couple. A similar but less scary attempt happened to a man named Andy Gregg in Arizona that same year. Andy had set up his nest in his home, and when he got home from work, he also heard a voice come out of his nest. But Andy seemed to get the other side of a coin. This individual identified himself as a security researcher and wanted to let him know that he was vulnerable. It's not necessarily what we in the field would call a responsible disclosure, but it was a disclosure nonetheless. And here, I think it was as good as I think this guy knew how to do. He claimed to be from a Canadian sect of Anonymous. And well, I've got a video that I found online of this interaction, so just listen to the conversation. Parts of it were recorded. And it's a little hard to make out, so I'm going to try to turn the volume up. But if you can't understand everything, I've got the transcript on my website for this video in the episode description. No shit. That's crazy. So we're we're uh, we're white hats, and I'm we don't have any malicious intent, but I'm just here to like kind of let you know, and so no one knows. Damn, man. Okay. All right. Well then, yeah, I appreciate it. Where, uh, like, are you able to see where I live and everything? I mean, just be creative, and there's so many malicious things someone could do with this. Right. Uh, Nest also offers two-factor authentication, so that no one, like, even if someone does get your password, they can't see what I did right here and log in. All right, cool. Well, uh, damn, that's actually insane. All right, well, yeah, thank you for letting me know, and, uh, yeah, appreciate it. All right, have a good night, man. And, uh, again, I'm sorry if I freaked you out. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Take care. No, honestly, I appreciate you doing it, to be honest with you, so a little bit of a wake-up call for sure. <laughs> I really can't imagine just coming home and having that kind of chill conversation with a random guy through my security system. Props to Andy, because this was honestly something that could have been terrifying. And props to the hacker for being calm and collected and trying to help Andy get his way back into a more secure mindset. But what happened to start all this? Why these two sets of customers? Well, it again goes back to something we've harked about in earlier episodes. Namely, that open source intelligence episode I had a few times back. These Nest owners had had their credentials compromised and disclosed to the internet. And while it wasn't necessarily a compromise from Nest, as in maybe Nest wasn't what was hacked, the hackers were able to take the information that they could find and apply it across multiple different environments until they found one that worked. In this case, it was a security system. And we're left looking at both sides of a coin that this result could have landed on through the lens of each of these families. Okay, at this point in the episode, you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, those seem like stereotypical targets, though. Open cameras, whatever accounts you can compromise, high rolling casinos. What kind of hacker wouldn't take a look at those things? And you're not wrong, but what if we took a look at something else? Let's take a look at a couple of kids' toys. Specifically, we're going to start with Cognitoy's Dino. It's a fun little thing. If you Google it, it looks like a cartoon T-Rex, and it integrates directly with IBM's Watson tool to let kids have conversations with the toy. It's an interesting take on a two-way toy that seems like it could have been a fun addition to my toy box when I was a kid. I can't say I wouldn't have liked it, but as interesting as it was, it was also rather vulnerable. To start, the device itself would broadcast a little web interface that you could access from your computer or your phone, but it turned out that that web interface was vulnerable to injection-style attacks. That meant that if an attacker was already on the same network as one of these, and it fed a specific request into the tool, sensitive data could be leaked out. And that was demonstrated when an attacker was able to effectively use the toy as its own network scanner. It mapped out every other device on the same part of a network segment, just using that kind of attack. I can't imagine having a children's toy on a network and suddenly you're seeing it scan out for every possible device. But it wasn't limited to identifying other things on the network. It was also found that there was plenty of plain text communication 
going on with the toy itself. Now, typically what you want to see is that traffic coming from a device is encrypted when it's traveling across the network. That makes it so that when an attacker is just sitting there, watching or listening, it would appear as though everything going across the network was hard to decode because it would be gibberish. Plain text traffic hasn't had anything done to it, and that means it's going to be pretty readable to anyone that's listening. And with that plain text information, it was possible to steal an owner's Wi-Fi login information and further plant yourself on the network. It's pretty crazy to me that these toys could be leveraged to effectively gain persistent access to someone's home network. Imagine having to have a discussion with your husband or wife that, oh no, we were hacked because we bought little Johnny a Cognitoy Dino. But that's not even the worst toy. In Germany, there was a doll called My Friend Kayla. Kayla was marketed as a friend for your child that listens. But apparently she listened a little bit too well. Because when security researchers started to look at her, what they found was kind of intimidating. At first, it started out as privacy concerns. Researchers noted that if a child talked to Kayla about some of its interests, say Disney, for example, that information might be given to third parties for marketing. And some of that, according to the manufacturer, was unfounded, but it got the ball rolling on discussions that would lead to an even heftier issue. In 2017, security researchers found that the toy had an unsecure Bluetooth device as a part of the listening capability. It helped the toy listen and talk to the child who was using it. We have similar devices, albeit more secure, in our Alexas, in our Google Homes, things like that. It's how they can pick up when we're talking directly to them. But that insecure Bluetooth meant that it was possible for hackers to potentially listen in on the conversations through the doll. That took it above and beyond just a simple breach of privacy through ad services and into a major security concern for families. It could offer an easy way to listen in on everything that's going on around the child. And it was so much of an issue that Germany would ban the toy and even recommend that families destroy it. Talk about a measured and appropriate response. I get it though, it was the only way to really guarantee that those weren't going to be seen elsewhere. If you throw it out, it might end up in another family's hands or at a donation bin. So you've kind of got to destroy it in order to maintain perfect security. We're going to age it up a bit for the next story and move from toys aimed at kids into something a bit more private and adult. I want to talk specifically about an issue that came to light in 2018 with the sex industry. I think we all know that there is a booming industry in the market of sex. And a part of that industry is aimed at devices that are remote control. Whether it's because the settings can be more fine-tuned that way, or as a way to give a long-distance relationships a bit more spice, remote control sex toys are starting to pop up on the Internet of Things. So much so that security researchers have actually taken to calling it something else. They're calling this specific subset of the Internet of Things the Internet of Dildos. Well, back in 2018, one specific gadget ran into some hot water when the Vibratissimo was found to be exploitable. These toys had their own app, and what was almost their own little social network where users could share experiences, pictures, videos, or even search for partners. And what researchers found was that from the high level, the database that contained customer data was effectively public. It was stored in clear text and readable to anyone who could find it. The data that was included in that database, that anyone could see, was the pictures they had taken, the videos they'd taken, chat logs, sexual preferences, and yeah, even usernames and passwords. So imagine you're an attacker and you've got the username and password of all these different people with remote controlled toys. Now you can log in and control those devices without any kind of authorization from the actual owner. It presented a very private and personal breach into these users' lives that they had trusted the company to protect, but was found to just be wide open and ready for anyone to walk in. That wasn't the only device to have those issues, though. In that same year, two others called the Magic Motion Flamingo and the Real Love Lydia were found to be equally prone to hacking scenarios like this one. These devices could have been turned on, could have been turned off, could have had pictures taken from them, all without the person who owns it knowing that it was happening. Or, in some cases, maybe they did know it was happening because they were using it. It's entirely possible 
that this could have led to non-consensual instances of people having their toys malfunction while it was during use. And that opens up an entirely new can of ethics into the already illegal hacking. Thankfully, it seems like the industry companies here learned their lessons and started to encrypt their data, but it wasn't without damage being done. Who knows what else could have been collected prior to that change, and who may have been compromised. We can only hope that they had a measured response and required people to change their passwords immediately after it was found. And while there wasn't a lot of depth to this attack, really what I wanted to highlight here is how vast the Internet of Things truly is, and how far across people's day-to-day -day lives it can spread into areas that you wouldn't have even thought about looking. So, we've hit on cameras, we've hit on toys for kids, toys for adults, and casinos. But I wanted to save, in my opinion, the best for last, and close this out with something that I found genuinely interesting, but also pretty scary. Let's talk about your car. I mentioned it briefly earlier, but there are reasons nowadays for you to have your car either possess its own Wi-Fi network or connect to yours. It could be for updates, it could be so that you can control certain aspects of it with your mobile device. Maybe it's even just for some quality of life enhancements that you don't really see, but happen on the back end. Well, a couple of hackers named Charlie Miller and Chris Velasic found that those little quality of life enhancements presented a unique way into ownership of the computer that controlled the Cherokee. We'll start at the very beginning. The exploitable service here through Jeep was offered by a subscription. And what they originally found was that after looking at the passwords that are generated automatically for the Wi-Fi enablement here, it would be perfectly possible to brute force the car if they had the right information. The Wi-Fi password that was generated for the multimedia system was based on the date and time in which you first turned the car on and that system was attached to it. That might seem like it's a big list to think about, and it is. But if you do your reconnaissance and find out when the car was manufactured, even just down to the right month, you can bring it to right around 15 million possible passwords. Velasic and Miller made a reasonable assumption as well. And that was that if they knew where the car was manufactured, they could limit it to business hours, maybe daytime in the area, and split that number down to around 7 million possible combinations. Now, for a person, that seems daunting. It's a lot of passwords, but for a computer, 7 million guesses is relatively easy. The only limitations that they had were the time it takes to send a password and receive a response, the fact that you need to be within range of a Wi-Fi antenna, and the fact that you need to spread out some of these requests in order to avoid bringing down the system altogether. It's possible there were other security concerns in mind, but these were the big ones. What this end result came to was that if Charlie and Chris followed a Jeep for an hour, with that information in hand, they could brute force it. So once they got in, they found that the multimedia system ran on a version of Linux, and proceeded as most hackers would. They looked for common issues in the operating system. Maybe they wiggled around a little bit and landed on a couple of key pieces of functionality that they could exploit remotely. It wasn't anything huge. They could change the radio, completely control the music player, and adjust the volume. And that might not be super scary at first, but think about two scenarios here. First, let's think about back to that baby monitor hack. Imagine if you were driving and someone's voice just came out of a speaker. You would have no way of knowing exactly how deep that hack ran, you would just know that someone's talking to you through your speakers and threatening you. The second concern comes from Kaspersky.com and their article about this situation. Imagine a potential problem if you're driving at 65 miles per hour and suddenly it goes to full volume static. I'm not talking about just volume up a couple times, I'm talking about volume max, pure static, and the kind of jump scare factor that presents a possibility of endangerment all on its own. I can't imagine anybody reacting rationally to that happening to them. There's more to it than just volume and media control, so that was just the beginning. The head unit for these cars connected to Sprint via a cellular network, and by setting up their own base station, these hackers were able to analyze traffic going to Sprint and effectively find any car that communicated in a way which signified it could be vulnerable to these same kinds of attacks. 
After all, there are specific bands and frequencies reserved for specific instances. Your car will always communicate on a reserved frequency when it's going through radio and cellular transmissions. What we found was that narrowing it down to a specific car proved challenging, but that they were able to do it. So now they had a bit more of a remote capability. Instead of just being right next to the car, they were able to access it through the network. What about a bit more in the way of impact, though? I'm sure they thought to themselves, how could they make a bigger splash here? Well, the car had something called a CAN bus. That's C-A-N. And that's the internal network of your car. Yeah, your car is a network. It might not be something you've thought about, but if you or someone you know has a more modern car, it's basically a network on wheels. The CAN bus connects all the big components of the car, to include the engine, the transmission, pretty much any kind of sensor, or anything that might need a computer to assist in it. And to the auto designer's credit here, it's pretty segmented from a multimedia server, so access wasn't guaranteed right away. But there was a bit of a middleman that could be exploited to help facilitate it. That middleman was called the V850 controller. While the multimedia server and the CAN bus didn't talk to each other, the multimedia server and the controller did, and the controller and the CAN bus did. So that effectively presented a route into the CAN bus from the media server if they could properly exploit it for that intrepid duo. To get access into the CAN bus, they tricked that controller into thinking that it had a firmware update and then supplied it with their own maliciously crafted update. Basically, it would be like giving someone a vitamin, telling them that it's good for them, and it turning out to be poison. And once that update was installed, they were no longer able to only listen to what the can was doing, but also give it directions. So, think about that. They could now give directions to the piece of equipment that controls everything. Here's a list of just some of the many things they could do with that level of access. And this is demonstrated in a video online for Wired.com. They could control the steering wheel. They could pump the brakes. They could mess with the air conditioning or the locks. They could even cut the transmission if they wanted to. There you have it. They own your car, and they can effectively make it do whatever they want. I don't think it would be anything as complicated as having a drive to a specific area, because, you know, that's still a level of self-driving we don't really have. But they could run you off the road or stop you dead in the highway. It's kind of scary to think about. And their hack led to a large recall of cars to make sure that that didn't happen to anyone. But it did take Chris and Charlie years to do this, because they're just two people. But imagine throwing the effort and the finances and the capabilities of a nation state behind that. With resources like that, it's possible to cut that time down significantly. And the last thing I want to touch on with regards to the car is that that subscription multimedia service called Uconnect was also vulnerable in its own way. Even if a hacker can't get directly to the car like we saw here, there's a bit more to worry about. Upstream, that Uconnect platform could have enabled some of the minor level of exploitation that we saw with the volume controls and GPS controls, things like that, but it was opened up to a much wider audience. Uconnect was loaded onto these cars for control of the entertainment, GPS, and some of the general functionality that supports the user in the car. But as we've said, they need to connect remotely to Uconnect servers to get updates or for troubleshooting. It's possible that if Uconnect had been compromised upstream, a hacker would be able to do some of those hacks across millions of possible cars. And if you think that's not a big deal, that Uconnect probably has their stuff together, I encourage you to go back and listen to episode one one more time. Because the Colonial Pipeline group thought that they had their stuff together too. But one weak link in the chain that they didn't even know was really a problem brought the whole pipeline to a grinding halt. And it's possible to do it here too. What I'm saying is that by using these tools for our own convenience, we are inheriting a risk that I don't think many of us realize they have. Because now we're adding a point of failure here in the form of that upstream server. And there are ways to prevent it. In fact, many companies have implemented the kind of segmentation techniques needed to do this. But as with anything, once a proof of concept is shown, it's only a matter of time before people dive even deeper and try to make their own way to circumvent whatever fix has been put into place. That brings me to the end of the cars, but I want to keep going a little bit. We've talked about some of the common themes here being 
that what tends to happen is that credentials are compromised and then the attackers just log into the tool, or they spend years trying to worm their way in through small exploits in the hardware. But there's more to it than just that. There are ways to just go out and do reconnaissance and find your own targets right now that might be vulnerable. At any given time, there are thousands of scanners crawling the internet and just cataloging anything they find waiting for people to go through and find those diamonds in the rough. One such tool is free, and it's super easy to use. It's called Shodan. You can go there right now. The website is shodan.io. That's S-H-O-D-A-N dot I-O. It may look a little bit intimidating, but if you go up to that search bar and just type in camera to their search engine, it's going to show you hundreds of thousands of cameras that are freely accessible to the internet right now, and you can just go and look in on with no credentials necessary. I would encourage you not to actually go in and look at these, but it gives you a bit of a screenshot of what the most recent picture was, and then will help you kind of see what kind of things are just floating out there. I'm looking at it right now, and one that I can already see that's a bit of a privacy buster is that there's someone's personal garage here. It's just one car, a bit of a tool shed, and I think it's an electric car that's plugged in. That's about all I can gleam on it, but if I really wanted to, I think I could open this up and find a couple more identifying things. And if I can do that within just a minute and a half, imagine what a hacker could do if they actually spent some time on it. It's this truly bizarre and amazing capability that we've got these days, where it's entirely possible that you might be spewing out something of your own information that you're not aware of, and it's just out there for the world to see. So what can you do about this? It can seem pretty scary knowing that all these modern accommodies can so easily be turned against you. But as with everything in our lives, it's all about calculating the amount of risk you're willing to take for the convenience. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm better than anyone else we've talked about today. I've got my own small suite of IoT devices that I allow to live on our network as a part of our life. It does make things easier, and sometimes I accept the risk that comes with it. Because there are specific ways that you can mitigate that risk. Some of it you've probably already heard, others you might not know about. If your router offers multi-band broadcasting, meaning that you can set something up on one network and have a separate Wi-Fi network for other situations, you can set it up so that all your devices that are IoT related, like your TVs, your Alexas, your cameras, all operate on their own network. Other things you can do tend to lend more onto the account side of things. You could use a bit more of a complex password. And I know some of you out there are going to roll your eyes at this, but just get a password manager. They'll take care of that complexity for you, and as long as you remember that single password to get in, the rest is on them. Another little bit of security that you can do is to enable two-factor authentication. That's the tool that either texts you, emails you, or relies on a pre-generated code from a separate application to get you in, in addition to your password. It's that concept of using something you have, which is the code, and something you know, which is the password, and those will work together to make it a bit harder for someone to take control of your account without you knowing, because on some level, you should be actively involved in every login attempt. If you want to go a bit more nuclear with it, you can always run everything yourself. There are home security systems that operate on a bit more of a closed loop network, out of your own home, that you can use, for example. In that case, you would have your own system that you control and doesn't ever need to touch the internet. But that's not super cost or time effective and comes with a lot of responsibility of maintaining your own uptime and the equipment. Like I said, it's just about the price of convenience versus the privacy when you do stuff like that, so you've got to consider that too. The last option? Just don't do it. At the end of the day, a lot of these aren't really necessities, are they? You don't need an Alexa or a Google Home. You don't necessarily need the smart TV or a most up-to-date car, or even one of those smart fridges or appliances. They just make things easier. And if you want them, I'm not going to knock you for it. After all, like I said, I've accepted some of this risk into my own life, but I've taken the precautions where I can to make sure that it doesn't come back and bite me. As can you. We have the responsibility to secure ourselves just as much as the manufacturer in some cases. So where do you draw the line? That's all you really have to ask yourself. Are you willing to make the concessions for a bit more of convenience in your day-to-day -day life, or do you want to live a little bit more close to being off the grid and not open yourself up to these kinds of vulnerabilities that might not even be public knowledge? 
Just think about it. And that's it for this week's episode. I just wanted to leave you with that little bit of a question at the end. Let me know where you draw the line on either Instagram or Twitter at shell underscore pod. Thanks for listening to me explain what the shell is going on with the Internet of Things. Before we go, I do have a couple of fun things I wanted to plug at the end of this episode, so bear with me for another minute or two if you can. The first is that I recently made an appearance on the So You Wanna Be in IT podcast. It's a very helpful podcast for people just getting into the field, and the hosts, Dean and Pat, are great guys that are aiming to help those kind of people just figure out what kind of tips and tricks can help you if you're just starting. I talk a little bit there about finding the right mentor and the kind of attitude that I had when I first started as a help desk worker way back when. So if you're interested, I encourage you to give them a bit of a listen. But there's not as much story about tech or anything, more about the story of me on that one. So I don't blame you if you don't want to take a look. The other thing that I wanted to plug is that on Friday, February 11th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, I'll be in our Discord audio chat for a bit, so you can feel free to come by and have a talk with me there. I'm going to try and have these a bit more frequently because a couple of listeners out there have expressed some interest, so if you're around, you can feel free to join. The link to the Discord channel is on the website, whattheshellpod.com, so I suggest that you head there and get the invite. You'll be able to come there, check out all the ancillary material from the episode, and have discussions with me and other listeners. We're not relatively large yet, but I'm hoping to grow it as the show grows as well. That's all for now. Make sure you tell a friend or a coworker about the show if you enjoy it, and I'll see you all in two weeks for our next episode.